everyone so we'll get started just gonna share the powerpoint that we'll go through today We get started. So we'll go through chapter 15, composition policy and regulation. So we'll go through industrial concentration and how governments combat it. And then the economic principles and difficulties about setting prices slash rates charged by natural monopolies. And then we'll go through social regulation. So industrial concentration is when a certain, a single firm or a small number of firms control the major portion of the output of an industry. So the horizontal merger would be if you purchase, if a company merges with another company in the same industry. So if a bank merges with another bank, a vertical merger would be if a manufacturer buys a distributor, uh, or the manufacturer buys the uh, creator of the inputs needed for manufacturing. And then conglomerate merger is when you merge with companies from other industries. So if you if a bank buys a railroad, or if a, a bank buys a tech company, and they all merge together. So yeah, horizontal merger, the Competition Bureau's main concern is unilateral market power of the new merged ent entity, as well as the combined market power of the four largest firms in the sector. And then vertical mergers most escape anti-combines prosecution because they do not substantially lessen competition. And then price fixing is dealt with strictly. So price fixing is when uh, companies work together and coordinate prices so they set prices the same, uh, the same level, in order to maximize profits. So that's what happened with bread prices with Loblaw. They set the bread prices at a certain high value, in order to maximize profits for each bread company. So each bread company was uh, coordinating with each other to set prices high, in order to maximize profits. And then price discrimination is when you set the price to what they're willing to pay. So you do that for each consumer. And you can figure that out through uh, using consumer data to figure out how much they value something. And tying contracts are when the, the buyer is forced to purchase all the other, or other products to buy a certain product. So this is a... This is illegal, yet tying contracts are illegal. Uh, then merger guidelines, mergers of Fording Inc., Tech Cominco Limited, Luscar Limited, and Console Energy Inc., they weren't challenged. But the mergers between Royal Bank of Canada, Bank of Montreal, and CIBC and the TD Bank were challenged. Because if, they, if those companies merge together, there'd be too much uh, anti-competition. So they wouldn't, it would be bad for consumers because they would have too much market power. If those market, if those companies merged together, there'd be too much market power and there wouldn't be enough uh, competition for consumers to uh, benefit. So then industrial concentration there might enforcement of competition laws may sometimes conflict with other goals, e.g., emerging new technologies. Then trade offs. Should the government temporarily suspend competition rules to encourage restructuring of industries and speed up the expansion of this new technology? So I'll ask the class that. What would be your answer to that question? So I'll bring that up again. So what would be your answer to that question there? Okay, so that's okay.
So I'll give you the test mark. I'll I'll mark it like I'll give it to everyone at the end of class today. Uh, so I'm still in the process of marking them. Just give me one second. I'll be right back. So I will, I will provide it at the end of class today. So good question. But the should the government temporarily spend uh, competition rules to to encourage the restructuring of industries and speed up the expansion of this new technology? I would say no, because competition drives innovation. We need competition to to drive innovation because uh, we're competing against another company. We need to, it's important to compete against another company because that allows us to be incentivized to innovate. Problem is when we have market power, is we don't have the incentive to innovate because because we're not trying to uh, compete with another com com with another competitor. So it's important that we uh, we have competition for innovation. And then the role of government's natural monopoly. So economies of scale are extensive that only a single firm can supply the entire market at a low enough unit cost. So that would be through public ownership, such as Canada Post, uh, energy works out like that, public transit. Can anyone think of another example of a what of a natural monopoly? So there's a few public transit, energy, Canada Post. Can you think of any other examples of that? Yeah, healthcare. That's a good one. That's a good one, Gregory. Um, I'll say water. Water would be like that. I'd say public schools. Uh, so. So yeah, a great example, Gregory. Can anyone think of any other examples of natural monopolies? Maybe the college or university. Oh, so can you say it again? Maybe I I mean like maybe the college. Yes, that that's that's a good that's a good um example. So yeah, public colleges, public colleges, public universities. Yeah, yeah, that that's great. So yeah, those would be under that because fifty percent of their funding comes from the provincial government. So yeah, the. So 50% of the funding comes from the provincial government. And the other 50% comes from uh, grants and uh, student tuition. So yeah, so that's, so those are great examples. Uh, Gregory, Ibrahim, and Hey Batmir. Those are excellent examples. Yeah, that's great. Mm -hmm. So then the pub public interest theory of regulation Industrial regulation is important to prevent monopoly prices and harming consumers in society. So yeah, it's important that we have regulation to prevent that. But the problem is there is issues with cost and inefficiency with industrial regulation because regulated firms don't have incentive to reduce operating costs. Then perpetuating monopoly regulation can sometimes perpetuate a monopoly long after the conditions of natural monopoly have been. So Industrial regulation has problems, including legal cartel theory. So that would provide occupational licensing. 
Uh, so companies could work together to companies could coordinate and set prices to maximize profits across the industry. So they could do that. And then deregulation. So deregulation has occurred since the 1970s, airlines, trucking, telecommunications, et cetera. And then deregulation of the financial industry caused uh, issues in 2008 where there was too much subprime lending and people who couldn't afford houses were getting houses and they foreclosed, uh, couldn't pay. And they lost the houses. And this happened, this happened at a very wide scale. Therefore, there were so many houses on the market. And this, cr this crashed the housing market because the supply of houses uh, trying to be sold was way higher than the demands for buying houses. So that's what happened here. And this happened because of this, this happened because of deregulation. Yeah, so they, um, they, with regulation, with, with effective regulation, only people that can afford mortgage payments could get houses. So that, that's, so that's why 2008 happened. It was, uh, it was due to uh, too much lending, yeah. So in the early 1960s, the new type of regulation began to emerge. That was social regulation. And this was focused on the condition under which goods and services are produced, the impact of production society, and the physical qualities of the goods. So we want to, with social regulation, we want to, the optimum level of a marginal benefit equals marginal cost. And social regulation has a lot of successes and it solves a lot of pro serious problems. It's expensive, but worthwhile. The problems with social regulation is the marginal cost is usually greater than marginal benefit, which is not what we want. We want them to be equal. Um, and then laws are poorly written and standards are hard to understand. And then there's too much regulation. So too much regulation is not good. Too little regulation is not good. So we need, we need MB to equal MC. We need easier to understand laws. And we need, need a balance of regulation and deregulation. So we need a balance between both. Yeah, too much. So too, uh, too much regulation is not good and too much deregulation is not good either. We need to be in the middle. So that's very important here. And then two reminders, there is no free lunch. Social regulation can produce higher prices, stifle innovation, reduce competition. Less government is not always better than more. Although the market system is a very powerful engine for producing goods and services and generating income, it has its flaws. So we need to balance it. We need to, we need to balance uh, the market system with regulation. So we need, we need a regulated market system, not too much regulation, not too little regulation. We just need to be in the middle and to ensure that uh, things are operating legally and yeah. 
So then we'll go through antitrust. So we, we talked about this in a previous class. In the 1980s, there was price fixing for the airline tariff publishing industry in the US. So they used to post, US airlines posted current and future prices for airline tickets on a centralized computer system. And this allowed for collusion. So this, the US government intervened, so they would stop the collusion here. So this allowed, so in this case, the airlines were coordinating to set their prices to maximize profits across the industry. And this coordination is illegal and it is called collusion. So like it is illegal for companies to coordinate on prices to maximize profit. So that is totally illegal. And the US government intervened in this case for the airlines. And then Microsoft, they we talked about this before. They their Windows products would only run Internet Explorer, which was their product, and it wouldn't let it wouldn't run Netscape Navigator. And this was a monopoly situation, and the US government intervened and stopped them from doing this, which was the right move. And then Google, the Google used the monopoly in internet searches to favor its Google shopping price comparison service. And that's very unethical. It favors their Google shopping over let's say Amazon, eBay or others. And that's, and that's not, that's not okay. Like it, it, there should be equality in that. So, eBay, Amazon, Google Shopping, all of those should should all rank at the same level and have all the same access. So that these are great cases that the U.S. Uh, intervened in uh, and other governments. It's the governments they should have intervened in all these cases and they did. So, so yeah, that's that's the antitrust situation here. So we're done chapter 15. So let's try, let's start. So. But if anyone, yeah, agreed, agreed, Gregory. Yeah, there's not enough competition in telecom. Agreed, you got it. Yeah, that's great. Does anyone, does anyone disagree? That would be interesting because like there could there there's probably a lot of good arguments to um to disagreeing uh, about this. Like yeah, Vivian, that's a good good point here. Yeah, become a monopoly. Yeah, there'd be too much market power. That's great, Vivian. Um what are what are Abraham and Haybad Mirror's thoughts on this? Yeah, any any opinions you have, if you're for or against, like I'd love to hear it because there's probably other good opinions on if if you're if you're pro this merger, there's probably a good argument for that as well. Because there's potential that foreign competition can come in and uh, allow for more competition in telecom. So like that could be a good argument as well if we get foreign competition or more competition. Uh, building in Canada. So like any any argument you can provide. There's there's definitely good arguments on the other side too. So if Ibrahim and Haybatmir have uh, an argument, feel free to see it. Okay, uh, yeah, if you have an argument, if you think of anything, just feel free to state it while we're going. Try to access the chat. Yeah, yeah, excellent. Hey, Batmir, that's that's good. Vivian, hey, Batmir, Gregory, that's great. And then Abraham, if you have anything, feel free to state it as well. 
So we'll go through factor pricing. So factor pricing, we need labor, land, capital, and entrepreneurial resources to produce goods and services. So factor prices are determined through money income determination, cost minimization, resource allocation, and policy issues. So um, assume output and factor market are perfectly competitive. Margin revenue product is changed into a revenue to revenue change to unit change in factor quality quantity. So in this case, um, the margin revenue product decreases over time because this is diminishing returns. Diminishing returns. Because as as our total revenue goes up, it um, the differ the difference between total revenue at each period, it gets smaller. So like here to start, it goes up by 14. And then here, next one, it goes up by 12. And then the next one goes up by 10. Next one goes up by eight. Next one goes up by six. Next one goes up by four. And the next one goes up by two. So it, it goes up, but at a decreasing rate. So that's, um, so that's what diminishing returns is. And that's what happens over time. And then we want to produce up until the point where um, marginal revenue product is equal to zero uh, to, in order to maximize revenue. So this, this is only this is only to maximize revenue. Not profit, because maximizing profits is a different it's a different calculation here. So in this case, to maximize profit, we have to hire additional units of a factor as long as each successive unit adds more to total revenue than it adds to total cost. So marginal factor cost is changing total factor cost by the unit change in factor quantity. So we want to produce up until this point here, uh, right here. And that's that's where it, it um, the best way, best producing point here. So we want to produce up to here because after that, marginal revenue will become negative. So this is where revenue would be maximized at forty seven twenty five here. Yeah. So revenue would be maximized here at forty seven twenty five. So pure competition would be a perfect diagonal line right here. And then perfect competition would be squiggly line like this here. Then what will shift the factor demand curve, changes in product demand, changes in productivity, quantities of other factors, technological advance and quality of the variable factor. And then factor demand curve will be shifted to changes in the price of other factors, substitute factors production, substitute effect, output effect, and net effect, complementary factors production. So changes in product demand, examples would be gambling increases the probability, and this would improve the demand for workers at casinos. Consumers reduce the demand for leather coats, so there's less demand for tanners. Federal government reduces spending on the military, so there's less demand for military personnel. Changes in productivity, an increase in the skill levels of positions, increases demand for the services. Computer assisted graphic design improves the productivity of and demand for graphic artists. Changes in the price of other factor, an increase in the price of electricity, increase the cost of producing aluminum and reduces demand for aluminum workers. Price of security equipment used by businesses to protect against illegal entry falls, decreases the demand for night guards. The price of cell phone equipment decreases, reducing the cost of cell phone and for service, which in turn increases demand for cell phone assemblers. So demand for labor will shift outward, rightward when the demand for that product produced by the labor increases, productivity of labor increases, price of the substitute input decreases, the price of substitute input increases, and the price of the complementary input decreases. So substitutes in production, substitute effect, is substitution effect is labor substituted for capital. 
production costs up, up or down, and a reduced amount of capital and labor are used. And in that case, the demand for labor would increase if the substitution effect is greater than the output effect. The, the demand for labor would decrease if the output effect exceeds the substitution effect. In the comments in production, there's no substitution of labor for capital. So labor and capital work together. It's kind of like you're working and using technology to improve your work. So for example, um, like you can use technology to improve your work for, for you use automation to improve your work performance. So certain tax, tasks you would automate while other tasks you would do on your own. So you'd use automation as an augmentation to your work. So this would um, reduce demand for labor ultimately. So elasticity of factor demand is the sensitivity of factor quantity to changes in factor prices. So it'd be percentage change in factor quantity divided by percentage change in factor price. So this would be determined through ease of resource substitutability Lost to see product demand and ratio of resource cost to cost. So in the long run, firms can vary all the factors of production that they use. All factor inputs are variable in the long run. So we have to think about what combination of factors will minimize costs of specific level of output and what combination of factors will maximize profit. So those are very important questions we have. And we would have to for the least cost to happen, we would have to make these equal. So marginal product of labor divided by price of labor would have to equal marginal product of capital divided by price of capital to minimize cost. So in this case, that wouldn't that wouldn't be true here because like this this one this example here, we would have to, these aren't equal. These would not equal each other. It would be 10 cannot equal five. So we would have to like reduce the price, reduce the price of capital to $0.5 in order to make them equal. So in that case, it would be 10 divided by one equals five divided by 0.5. Then that'd be 10, this would be 10, and then this would be the least cost. So in this case, the MPL must equal 10, PL must equal a dollar, MPC must equal five, PC must equal a dollar in order to make costs minimized. So that's very important here. So in this case, for this one, we would have to have the labor price of eight here. And then we'd have to have the marginal product of labor here. And then we'd have the, have the capital price here. And then we'd have to have the marginal product of capital here to make uh, it, them least cost. So this would allow for least cost because, because MPL divided by PL equal MPC divided by PC. So yeah, in order to minimize costs, we need to have this, these things equal. To minimize costs, these must be equal. So in this case, the if you're a banker, you use it an automated banking machine to augment your work. So it's not just you doing the banking, like you have an automated banking machine 
that helps you do the work. So it's both you, like the automated banking machine is not a substitute for a financial advisor. The automated banking machine is a complement to a financial advisor. The automated banking machine augments the work of a financial advisor, supports the person in working. So that's very important. This is this is an important this is an important distinction. So like in this case, uh, in this case, the robot will not take over the human, the human's job. The robot supports the human in completing work. So we need to determine, so most industries are like this. So like cars are not fully autonomous. They, cars have, so like autonomous vehicles, so like semi-autonomous vehicles still need human drivers but the human driver is assisted by the aut semi-autonomous vehicle. So like basically uh, the robots work with humans. So like they work together to get the job done. So like a uh, robots complement humans not substitute humans. So that's that's a very important thing here. So can anyone think of, so like I'll ask a question, can anyone think of an example of robots and humans complementing each other in work, both uh, working alongside to get work done. Can you think of any examples of that? So like, I think the robot and the people, like there's a the difference because the, also the people was thinking the robot, you know, like robot cannot think by themselves, you know, like they making something and robot is thinking it. And it means the robot cannot do something by themselves, you know, that people have to do or people needs to let them. I don't know, you know, how to figure out that. But there's a different between them. Agreed, agreed. That, that's good. Yeah, the robot can't really uh, solve problems. Exactly. Right? The people is, yeah, doing the some like some something on that. And after that, robot is doing it. And robot can do more faster than people's. But no robot cannot think like a people's, can solve the problem like a people's. That's a different. That's great. That's a great answer, hey Babi. That, that's great. Um, yeah, that, that, that's great. Um, yeah, that, that's that's correct. And then Vivian said, Vivian said, Google Assistant on our phones, exactly. So we could be working, and then if we need an answer, we ask Google Assistant. So that that's an augmentation. So we can get you know information from Google Assistant while we're working. So great examples, hey Babmir and Vivian, that's great. So that that was great work on that. So the next thing we'll do. So I'll, I'll share my screen here. Let's try this here. Yes, yeah, yeah, good job, hey about me, yeah, that's great. So we'll try this here. It's it's a it's a new game. It's called Get Gimkit. It's really uh, it's a really good game. 
let's try this. It's uh, it'll be on a lot of uh, what we've learned so far today and last few classes. So I think we'll get started, but uh, if you want to come in after, you still can. There's no, there's no, uh, cold, there's no like uh, late, lateness. <laughs> so what's socialism? <laughs> Which of the following is an example of a natural monopoly? So, ice cream stands, Coca Cola, corn, public water. Great job, public water. True or false, there are many firms of monopoly. And the market structure with the most control over prices is what? And capitalism, an economic system where there is no competition, everyone has true equality, everything is shared communally. Goal is the economic system is profit motive or increasing one's wealth or industrial factory workers. So, Professor? Yes. Like, are we going to do something after done this? Uh, yes. So, what we'll do is we're going to do, uh, we'll do some work on the economics of the pandemic. So, after we're going to complete this. Uh, but if, uh, 
but yeah, like let me know if, if you do need to go. It's like perfectly fine. Um, yeah, I need yeah. to take my I need to take my sister from the school. That's why I need to, I had to left. Oh, that's okay. That's okay. Yeah, and thanks, sir, for, a, thanks for coming in. Thank you so much. And I have one last question. Like yesterday, I was did the, my chapter ten and chapter eleven homeworks in the uh, connect. I saw the mark over there, but when I got the grade in the Seneca page, I cannot see it. It's gonna upload it next week or something. Uh, I'll have to. I'll check. We have a uh, until December seven, right? For the all connect work and other assignment. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So yeah, no problem. I'll check. Um... So check your, so what was this homework called? I didn't know connect. It was like chapter 11 and chapter 10. So I got chapter 11 here. Uh, mm -hmm. Chapter 11 I was completed. Uh, 13 and midterm exam and test two were completed. Yeah. Anything is, is grading over there or just tests are grading? Uh, the homework is graded too. Homework is graded too? Yeah. Uh, other assignment or something? No, right? There's a, a homework and assignment. Assignment is not for not marking. So I, I'm grading everything um, for that. Like I'm grading everything that's on there. And I'll bring up the waiting. Uh, so I'll bring up the waiting. So the waiting of that. So everything that's so I'm gonna share my screen here. Yeah, thank you. I just need a little bit to explain about that. So the grading, so everything is graded mm -hmm. on Connect. So the so the um this the connect stuff is ten percent is twenty percent total. So everything on Connect, all the all the homework on Connect is graded. Mm -hmm. It's twenty percent, and then the unit test is fifteen percent. Unit test two is fifteen percent. Final exam is twenty percent. But all the um, I'll pull up the Connect stuff here. The so I did all the tests or something. It's no problem on the test quiz over there. I just didn't do the homeworks because like I did them they're just for practice. I was just looking at like, but last last week I was asking to you and you said it's for marking and I was starting to doing. So all of this here, um, mm -hmm. doing all like uh, all this, uh, all the assigned work here, mm -hmm. um, it all, all of it will be 20% total here. All um, of them is 20. Yeah, yeah. So it all adds up to 20%. So okay. the um so like each of these will be like less than one percent, one percent of the 20% each. But if you add them all up together, it'll be 20%. Yeah. Mm, okay. I got you. Thank you for explaining. Yeah, no problem. Uh yeah, so it'll all add up 20%. So um, but I anticipate it's gonna be but with that um do as much as you can here mm -hmm. um so like as like if you can do all of it you'll get the full 20 percent um but try to do as much as you can yeah i'll try how much i can right exactly yeah. i have one to december 7 like I, I think i will do all of them okay cool because if you do all of this i wanted to make it all for marks all this stuff here mm -hmm. because if you do all of it you will get a very high mark in the class. Um, this is like doing all this, you'll do very, like you'll be able to do well in the final and the midterm and the tests. Yeah. I try, sir. Cool, excellent. Just try your best and uh, and yeah, like you'll do better and better. And um, yeah. other two assignment is doing a December 7, right? Yeah. Okay, perfect, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Um, so yeah, that's, that's that.
And uh, what I'll do is I'll, so here, I'm just gonna pause the game right now and then I'll go to the, uh, the COVID um, analysis here. The economic analysis of COVID. So here with, with COVID, the economy is at the inefficient level here because, because there was just reduced output to the lockdowns. So we we're here on the PPF because of the lockdowns. Um, but without the lockdowns, we would be right here. Without, without lockdowns, we would have been right here in, the, in 2020. And then um, without lockdowns, we would have been here in 2021. Okay. Uh, no problem, hey, Bob. Uh, hey, Bob. Uh, great job today, hey, Bob. But um, I do believe the lockdowns were worth it because we saved a lot of people's lives through not, like through, um, through reducing hospital emissions and ICU emissions. So it was important to lock the economy down. And there was, uh, it was important to lock the economy down just for the health crisis. So like this cost the economy was, was needed because we were solving, we were reducing the amount of hospital emissions and ICU emissions. Um, yeah, through keeping people at home. So that was very important. Um, yeah, so, so Vivian, if you have any um, argument about that, feel free. Um, what you think about, like, what's your view on that? Do you think uh, it was worth it to lock stuff down? Or, um, or was it, would, would you have kept the economy open? Yeah, any, any, any opinion is fine. Yeah. Yeah, agreed. Yeah. Like, and uh, even if you went the other way, that'd be, that'd be uh, fine too. Like there's good arguments on both sides. I do believe that with the um, lockdowns, it was important for public health. So yeah, good job Vivian on that. that was, that's a good argument. And then here with the circular flow diagram, Yes, agreed. Like there would have been a lot more cost to it if we didn't lock it down because um, we would have had a lot more um, issues. So yeah, exactly, Vivian. So here with, um, so with the lockdowns, there was reduced consumption, reduced revenue, reduced income, reduced interest, reduced profits. So a lot of that did happen, but it was worth it because like now, um, like it was worth it because we needed to keep hospital capacity uh, within acceptable levels. So that was that was important. Uh, yeah. So the cost was in, the cost was was definitely necessary. To keep hospitals open. And then here for the demand for toilet paper, because people were staying at home, uh, they weren't going to the office. Um, they were staying at home. The demand for toilet paper at home was much higher, so it shifted right. In the office, it went down. So that that's so it shifted. So the toilet paper demand, toilet paper demand, shifted from the office to the home. So that's what happened here. But here the. So here the, it was important, social distancing was important to preventing COVID-19 
and this was a positive externality. So it caused more social benefits. So we were able to uh, benefit socially through the social distancing. So this was beneficial for us as an economy through this positive externality. So um, social distancing provided many positive externalities, most of which reducing disease. And this had a massive uh, positive externality. So that was important. And this allowed for a large increase in in surplus. So that was important here. But however, there were a lot of breakdowns in government. We didn't have a lot of preparedness in long-term care facilities where 70 to 80% of the deaths occurred and in nursing homes. So we had to get the Canadian Armed Services, the Canadian Armed Forces to come in to, uh, to support these areas. And then we weren't, we weren't able to test for this disease in other provinces, in all the provinces. And then there wasn't enough protect, personal protective equipment. And there wasn't enough coordination for sharing information among Canadian provinces. So the demand curve for products increased massively during COVID. And, and then our, so like the price, the demands, for products such as toilet paper went up during COVID-19, which shifted the demand curve to the right. And also our price elasticity of demand for products like toilet paper went up. So, uh, that made the demand curve steeper. And we had a higher willingness to pay for products like toilet paper. And this led to companies price discriminating against people through price gouging. So they charged much higher prices for us because we valued toilet paper more. That's what happened here. And it was a massive issue. So in this case, uh, comp like products like hand sanitizer, in this case, we had a much higher marginal utility per unit for, uh, for these products. So the companies were charging higher prices because they knew we valued the product more. And this was price discrimination because we valued it more because of the pandemic and we needed hand sanitizer, so they did this. And uh, so in this case, the marginal utility per dollar of panic products like toilet paper went up and that's why they charged a higher price. This is why they charged a higher price. Yeah, so this, uh, this was a big problem they had. And then the COVID-19 struck China first so this caused a lot of severe lockdowns in China. And then based on this, less, less production was happening in China. So Canada and other countries had to rely on other nations to produce instead of China. So they looked at, so they got uh, production from Japan, South Korea and other areas in, uh, to replace China's production because China's lockdowns had this, like stopped a lot of the production they were getting from China. So they needed replacements. And then also here, the price, the price um, from the prices uh, during COVID-19 for air travel, airplanes, 
airplane tickets and restaurants went down below average variable costs. Therefore, these companies shut down in the short run. However, if this stayed the same in the long term, where their price would be below average variable cost, they would shut down permanently. So this, uh, so this was, uh, so, um, so yeah, that was that was a concern. So in COVID nineteen, airplane companies and restaurants, um, they were they had to shut down because their price was below average variable cost. And in the long run, if this was the case, they would have to shut down permanently. However, it wasn't the case. So that was important. So um, exercise what happens if the, to the firm if the selling price never rises again, rises back to price normal, they would shut down permanently. So that would be a big issue. So, so, it, so fortunately, it, the price went, up, went back to normal or higher, fortunately. So fortunately, after a while, the price for restaurants and air travel went above, like went to price normal or higher to keep them open. So like um, if price was at COVID levels, for airplanes and restaurants, we wouldn't have these industries anymore. Uh, so like if the price was at COVID-19 levels for airplanes and restaurants long-term, we wouldn't have these industries anymore. So that would be a big problem. And then, so collapse of demand caused by COVID-19 will adversely affect certain monopolies. So via rails ridership dropped dramatically when COVID-19 lockdowns were happening. So the monopolies may need government assistance in this case. So I'll ask you, Vivian, uh, should every monopoly plunge into negative profits by COVID-19 get bailout money? If not, which ones, if any? So which, uh, which monopolies should get bailout money? Yeah, so yeah, exactly. Only crucial monopolies, exactly. So um, which crucial monopolies can you think of um, that would uh, fit that? The array would be one here. I would say TTC, a go train, um, water, water utilities, Hydro One. Yeah, internet, uh, yeah, basic needs. Yeah, exactly. So, like, yeah, water and electricity. Yeah. That's great. Great job, Vivian. That's the great example there. That's great. So then here, monopolistic and competitive industries are inefficient, but bountiful in variety. So, uh, so a lot of local eateries 
are going bankrupt than chain restaurants because of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, because they were just not making any profits during the pandemic. So they had to go bankrupt. So a lot of like local like non-chain restaurants. So like because the price during the COVID-19 pandemic was lower than average variable costs for restaurants. Big companies like McDonald's, KFC, and others could uh, afford these costs, but small restaurants could not. Therefore, a lot of small restaurants went bankrupt. So that was a big problem here. Uh, so like the large chains could pay off the cost of a pandemic, but small restaurants could not uh, in a lot of cases, not all, some got through it. So yeah. And then here, the lockdowns, they caused oil demand to decrease because people were not driving. So like people, people were not driving because everything was shut down. Therefore, the demand for oil would decrease. And then COVID-19 lockdowns uh, caused bars and restaurants, live entertainment events and airlines to go bankrupt if they weren't able to pay, if they weren't able to, uh, like, if they didn't have enough money to serve, like, if they didn't have enough uh, cash to sustain themselves. So then research and development spending, um, that's something that we'll look at. So what effect does all these bankruptcies have on research and development spending and on innovation efficiency? So, so according to the theory, research and development expenditures rise with industry concentration until the poor firm concentration ratio reaches about 50%. So, um, so what would happen if there's a wave of bankruptcies that hit the airline industry, would this increase or decrease R&D spending? Vivian, um, what, would, what would be uh, the, would uh, bankruptcies increase R&D spending or decrease R&D spending? Yeah, I'd agree. Yeah, good point there. And then the COVID-19 shutdowns caused extensive uh, unemployment. So there was massive reductions here all across the board. So every area reduced unemployment, like reduced employment. So like from May, from April to May, May 2020, employment reduced in every in every major city in Canada. It's so like a range from like it went from reducing by like negative two to negative seven percent across the board. Two to like seven percent across the board. So like yeah the economic effects were very apparent here. And then the government intervened to reduce interest rates. And they did this to, um, so they, it was important they did this because if they didn't, like the interest rate would have went to here 
if they didn't intervene. So they had to intervene to bring down the interest rate. So like if the gov if the Bank of Canada didn't reduce the interest rate during COVID-19, uh, the interest rate would have skyrocketed, would have skyrocketed. And people would not have been able to uh, borrow. So that would have been a big issue. So the Bank of Canada had to reduce interest rates to uh, allow people to borrow to grow the economy. And then uh, here, as I talked about before, um, the lockdowns in China, they stopped a lot of the manufacturing we rely on from China. And we had to go to other countries to manufacture products. So that was that was very important for us. We had to diversify the amount of the types of manufacturing we have. So we'd have to rely on other countries to help us with manufacturing. And now we have more countries that we can we can import from instead of just China. So there's other countries that we are importing from for manufacturing now. So that's that's the economic analysis of COVID-19. So that's yeah, so I wanted to go through that.